Hey folks, Winston for Carbide 3D here. We're always on the lookout for ways to improve our products and add value for our users. And one area that's been on our radar is the vCarve inlay functionality in Carbide Create. Inlay mode is included in the basic version of Carbide Create version 7, which is free for all owners of Carbide 3D CNCs. But in its prior iteration, there were certain cases where our workflow could produce an imperfect inlay, and that really bugged us. So we took a step back, did a lot of testing, worked through some issues we found, and are back with what is effectively Inlay Mode 2.0 for Carbide Create. This new workflow is simpler than its predecessor, while consistently yielding better results across the board. Today, I'm going to show you how to use this updated vCarve Inlay Mode with an example in the form of a drink coaster. The materials I'm going to use are bamboo plywood and some walnut. We'd recommend using fine-grained hardwoods for inlays, like maple or walnut, since you'll need your inlays to hold fine details without chipping out when machined. Softer woods like pine and coarser-grained woods like red oak may not retain delicate features as well. The bare minimum of tools I'll need for this project are an 8th inch end mill, like the Carbide 3D 102, and a 60 degree V-bit, in this case our 302. If you're working with materials that tend to have fuzzier edges when cut, using down-cutting end mills like the Amana 46200-K or Carbide 3D's 251 may help, but we can talk about that more when we're machining. Let's jump into the latest version of Carbide Create and get started with the design. We're going to need to draw up two parts for this inlaid coaster. One is a part with a pocket to receive an inlay. In my case, that would be the body of the coaster. The other is the inlay plug that will drop perfectly into that pocketed coaster. Let's tackle the coaster body first. This part will be cut from the bamboo plywood, so I'll make sure my settings in the setup panel reflect that. The important one here is the stock thickness. To start off my design, I'll first draw a 100mm circle on my canvas and move it to the lower left corner where my origin is. This will be the outer profile of the coaster. Now I need something to inlay. I'm using a Nuka Cola logo because my boss George is a big Fallout fan and I'm trying to curry favor here. But in general, the best candidates for V-Carve inlays are designs that have sharp corners. If a design didn't have sharp corners, you could cut pockets to receive match and cutout shapes easily without inlay mode. But inlaying a design that has sharp corners? Now that's a flex, and it's what makes detailed V-Carve inlays such a special and compelling use case for CNCs. I'll drag my SVG design elements into the canvas, delete any extraneous vectors, and then group the features so that they stay together. I'll use the scaling tool to size the Nuka Cola logo to fit nicely inside this circle. And using the move tool, I can then position that logo in the center of the coaster. Although, because of the shape and positioning of the swoosh in that logo, I think nudging the whole design a millimeter off center actually looks more natural. That way, everything looks more evenly spaced around the edges. Now, I think we're ready for cam. The tool padding for the coaster blank is relatively easy. First, I'm going to throw an advanced V-carve toolpath on the Nuka Cola design. The depth of this advanced V-carve will be 5mm. I will also take the checkbox to enable area pocketing. In case you're wondering what settings I would use for this project, here they are. Depending on your material and machine configuration, you might be able to push your CNC faster. Or you might want to slow things down for maximum accuracy if you have a lot of really fine, delicate features in your design. Bamboo plywood is generally pretty tough and stable, so I'm not super worried about it chipping out. I don't need to baby the material by taking super shallow step-downs. I'd consider these settings pretty safe and also usable for most common hardwoods. I will also note that in this example, for this particular operation, the 8th inch end mill isn't actually used for pocketing since it's too large to fit in this geometry. But area pocketing does still need to be enabled so that the V-bit will go to work where the pocket bottoms out. To cut out my coaster, I'll be applying a contour toolpath to that 100mm diameter circle in my design. Same cutting parameters for the 8th inch end mill that I mentioned before, and I want this toolpath to go all the way to the bottom of my stock material. This is what the simulation for the coaster looks like. We'll see how closely it matches the machine piece when we get to the shop. I'll export my toolpaths to a separate file and do some housekeeping before working on the inlay plug. I think it's easier to keep my master designs in one file, so I need to make sure I'm staying organized to avoid any confusion later. I'll rename my default toolpath group as Coaster Toolpaths and then disable it to clear the slate, so to speak. 
Then I'll make a new group for inlay plug toolpaths, which we'll populate shortly. Cleanup complete, let's go back into the design workspace. The inlay plug will be machined from Walnut, so I'll edit the thickness settings in the setup accordingly. The most important thing you need to remember for V-Carve inlays is that the inlaid plug needs to be mirrored. Otherwise, you're going to have an unwelcomed educational moment at your CNC when things don't fit. I'll copy and paste my new Coca-Cola design, use the horizontal mirror function to flip the logo, and then move it aside while I do a little more cleanup. With that mirrored logo still selected, I'll open up the Layers toolbox, hotkey L if you're into that kind of thing, and create a layer just for my inlay plug. Then I'll click on the Options button, that dot 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 next to the layer in question, and move my mirrored design to that layer. I'll also activate this layer so anything else I create is automatically assigned to this layer. Now I can hide my original coaster design, which is on the black default layer. Layers can be just as useful for organization as they are for assigning toolpaths, so if you're not using this feature already, I highly recommend giving it a try. To turn my design into a V-carvable plug, we need to draw an additional boundary that encapsulates the design. This could be as simple as a rectangle or circle drawn around the design, or as streamlined and optimized as an offset vector. Why do we need to do this? Well, the inlay plug needs to be the opposite or inverse of what was originally machined. It has to form a positive twin to the negative that is the pocketed coaster. Drawing a boundary that encompasses your design causes the toolpathing algorithm to flip. It will machine around the design instead of machining inside the design. That creates the matching shape that will fit into the coaster. For the sake of minimizing the amount of material I will need to vaporize with my CNC, I'll create a streamlined offset vector 6mm outside the backwards Nuka-Cola logo, taking care to also clean up any vector bubbles that are formed in the process. Now that I have this, I can go make a toolpath. I'll create an advanced V-Carve toolpath and select my design and its boundary. You can do it by selecting everything on your canvas first, or selecting it by layer. Either way is valid. I'll enable area pocketing and use the same cutting parameters as before. The last section of the advanced V-Carve dialog is where things will start to differ. This time we'll check the box to enable inlay plug mode. When you do that, the depth parameters and the helpful diagram next to the field will change. What these parameters are, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll give you my thought process about how to pick these values. My coaster has a pocket that is nominally 5mm deep. The plug I make should not exceed this depth, and to account for space where glue might pool and accumulate, it would even be beneficial to shorten the plug to create a small artificial gap between the bottom of the inlay and the floor of the pocket. What has worked well for us in testing is to specify the plug depth to be half a millimeter less than the depth of the pocket. In this case, that would work out to be 4.5 millimeters. The top gap is the nominal flat-to-flat -flat distance between your pieces. You'll want some amount of gap for two reasons. One is to allow for glue squeeze-out. You just need a little bit of space for glue to escape when you clamp everything together. Two is because this gives you some margin for error. If your pocket gets machined a little too big or your plug is a little too small, you have some extra material to wedge into that pocket. There is an optional third reason, which is that if you want to cut off excess material from the inlay with a bandsaw, having this gap will make it much easier for you and the saw. In our testing, a top gap of 1 or 2 millimeters has worked out pretty well. That's all you need to machine the inlay geometry. To separate the plug from the rest of its stock, I'll manually select the encapsulating vector and throw a contour toolpath on it that goes down to the bottom of the stock. Here's a quick tip. You can use the variable t to represent the stock thickness, and you can also evaluate basic math expressions in these fields as well. So if you ever think you'll want to run a project again on a material that's a different thickness, using variables in your toolpaths can be a great time saver and help you avoid mistakes like forgetting to change your cutting depth. You'll be able to measure your stock, plug its thickness into your project settings, and your toolpath depths will all be automatically updated. Okay, that wraps up the toolpath for the plug. We can double check the simulation, but I think we're ready to do some machining. At the Shape Oak 05, I'm going to start with my bamboo plywood. I'll be using double-sided tape for work holding since I'm too lazy to use clamps and tabs. This is also partly why my speeds and feeds aren't as aggressive as they could be, even though I have a big fat 80mm VFD spindle on this machine. I don't want to accidentally rip the material off the table and send it flying. 
After setting my origin and loading a V-bit, I'll let my coaster toolpath do its thing. Remember, this design was too narrow for an 8th inch end mill to effectively do the area pocketing, which is why we're jumping straight into the V-carving. Then, with a quick swap over to an 8th inch end mill, I'll liberate my coaster from its stock. One thing to note here is that I've substituted an Amana 8th inch downcutting end mill for the 102 end mill I'd normally use. Stray bamboo fibers can be pulled like a thread for quite some distance across the plywood face, so on the cosmetic side of this coaster, I want to do everything I can to minimize the fuzzies. This is where a downcutting bit shines. Using a synthetic bristle brush can help remove any fuzz in the valleys of the V-carve, and some fine grit sandpaper will shear off any stray fibers on the top surface before they can cause problems. This looks good, or at least good enough. I kind of messed it up by aligning my origin and thus my coaster too closely to the edge of the material. There's a small flat on the bottom of the coaster, but thankfully it's almost impossible to notice unless you're looking for it. Now for the inlay plug. I'll start by securing my walnut and setting my origin at the corner. Eighth inch end mill goes into the spindle and we're off to the races. Then we switch to the V-bit. And then for speed and because this material is thicker than half an inch, I'm using a 251 quarter inch down cutting end mill to separate my inlay from the stock. I can push this cutter a little harder than the eighth inch end mill. Brush off any fuzzies and we're good to go. It's always good to do a preliminary check, matching the coaster to the inlay. These should fit pretty tightly without any noticeable play and with a small gap between the bamboo and walnut faces. So far, so good. Now for the real test. When making an inlay, you want to make sure you thoroughly coat every mating surface with glue. This will not only ensure your plug is secure and evenly supported underneath, but it will help fill tiny gaps and voids. And then, once you join the pocket with the inlay, clamp the heck out of it. The more pressure the better, because you'll get a cleaner looking inlay with imperceptibly small gaps. Now, the amount of force involved in this step as you wedge the inlay into the pocket and squeeze out excess glue is pretty significant. This is one reason I'd recommend cutting your inlay plug out of material that's at least half an inch thick, so the backing material has enough strength to hold together. Or if you really want to be frugal and start with a thinner piece of wood, put an extra piece of wood behind the plug to help distribute the force evenly when you're clamping. Depending on the glue type, your set time may be different, but we'd always recommend letting the inlay sit overnight before you try to cut away the excess material. Speaking of cutting away that material, to machine away the plug I'm going to do some quick math. My coaster plus inlay will be my stock thickness here, and I want to cut down until I'm just above the surface of the coaster. I want the inlay to stand just a fraction of a millimeter proud for cleanup. Referring back to my original coaster design in the design workspace, I'll draw a generously oversized rectangle over where my Nuka Cola logo is. This just needs to roughly align to where my inlay plug is. Also, just to make sure this rectangle doesn't interfere with the inlay plug machining, make sure you put this vector on a different layer. Going into the toolpathing workspace, I'll select this rectangle and apply a pocketing toolpath with the appropriate depth to achieve the desired result. At the CNC, I'll start by taping down my puck of wood and eyeballing the front and leftmost points of the coaster. This doesn't need to be a super precise zero, at least in the horizontal plane. You'll want to get your zero height pretty close to exact though. Then I'll run my plug removal program and wait anxiously for the final inlay to reveal itself. Now this looks exactly like what I want, and it avoids two pitfalls that can create more work for you. The first is that if my pocketing toolpath had touched the coaster, the end mill could leave toolpath marks on the bamboo. Even if you have a perfectly trimmed spindle, a spinning end mill can impart swirl marks into the wood fibers that you'll have to sand out. The second is that when you inevitably do sand your inlay, having both inlay and plug at the same depth will create mixed dust. 
That dust can work its way into the wood fibers and pores, reducing the contrast you get. You can try to vacuum that dust out, but it will never be perfect. In this example, you can see both those flaws. Ideally, I would have wanted to only sand away the walnut and stopped as soon as it was flush with the bamboo, but I wanted to try and sand away as much of the tool pathing marks as I reasonably could, and now there's some bamboo dust forever stuck in the walnut grain. An alternate way I could have approached removing the excess plug material would be to hack a 3D roughing toolpath in Carbide Create Pro. I can trick Create to produce a surfacing pass parallel to the natural grain direction. This hides toolpath marks much better and requires much less sanding to make the face of the coaster flawless. That's how I got this coaster to look perfect even though my surfacing toolpath touched the face of the bamboo. On my Fallout inspired coaster though, things are looking pretty good. After a little bit of sanding, all that's left to do is apply a coat of finish. And there we go. One V-carve inlaid coaster ready for service in whatever post-apocalyptic saloon you frequent. So to summarize, in order to create a V-carve inlay, you need two designs. The first design will be advanced V-carved directly into your stock as a pocket. The second design for the plug needs to be mirrored and then have a contour drawn around it. Then you can apply an advanced V-carve operation selecting inlay plug mode in the toolpath options. Beyond that, you should already have the skills you need. This capability is something we've been really excited to roll out because it has so much potential in artistic applications, and we think this adds a lot of value for CNC woodworkers. We hope you give it a try and look forward to seeing your results. If you have any feedback about it, you can share it in our forum thread, which I will link in the description below. Oh, and before Kevin finds out I snuck back onto the Carbide YouTube channel, I do have one advanced tip to share regarding Carbide Create. You may have noticed that I don't show myself setting a zero height at the CNC. That's because in many cases I prefer having my zero set at the bottom of my material. This inlay project features multiple sets of toolpads that all have to start at different heights. Instead of setting a zero height every single time, I can gauge the surface of the hybrid table once and never think about it again. And to account for the thickness of double-sided tape, I can just use a piece of paper folded into thirds when I touch off on the hybrid table. It gets me a flawless depth of cut every time where I just barely reach the tape. This workflow may not be for everyone, but it's how I prefer to work. And regardless of your preferences, whenever you load a new or old program, you should always look at the preview as a gut check. Are my cuts above my origin, or do they go below the origin? Should I set my zero at the top of the material, or at the waste board? Because past you might have specified an origin differently. Alright, that's all I have for this video. Good luck, and have fun machining, folks.